And let's, uh, let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, yes. Lord, you're so good. Yes. You're so loving. Father, you are the shepherd, Father. You are the, yes. the example, Father. Um, Lord, I thank you, Father, that we're, just, we're not greater one than another. Lord, I'm not greater than the people that's sitting here. Lord, in fact, uh, we're all servants, Lord, and you're the shepherd. And we are all your sheep, Lord. Yes. Yes. Father, I thank you, Lord, for... Lord, for the sheep, Father, that you've brought here. I thank you for the people, Lord, that uh, show their love, Lord. They don't just say it, Father, they show it. They show it in finances, Father. They show it uh, in, in food. They show it in prayer. They show it in a phone call, uh, just checking up on me. And, and Father, I thank you, Lord, for, Lord, a good crew, Father, a good flock, Lord. Thank you, Father. Lord, I ask that you would grow us, Lord. Um, according to your will and your purposes, Father. Um, we don't have to be thousands. We don't have to be hundreds, Lord. Um, we just want to be what it is that you've called us to be. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, and amen. Um, the message the Lord gave me this week um, was, I wrote, um, why does Noah matter? Noah. Why does Noah matter today for you and me? Um, very, very, you guys know the basics. You know that we built Noah's Ark. Um, I've given you, uh, went over about Noah's Ark to three levels representing in one boat the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I told you what the animals represented, the Jews and the Gentiles, the clean animals and the unclean animals being engrafted in. Um, I told you that Noah, his name means rest. He was, you know, the tenth from Adam. And the Bible says in Hebrews that Christ is our rest and we're to strive to enter into that rest. So uh, just as Noah, uh, Noah was a picture of Jesus Christ, Noah built an ark and uh, prepared it wherein eight souls were saved. Him, his wife, his three sons, Shem, Ham, and Jabeth, and their three wives. And then, you know, seven of every clean animal and two of every unclean animal came into the ark through the door. The door is Christ, I told you guys. Um, it was a, a big picture of Jesus Christ. And I told you how uh, Jesus had said about, you know, the woman that came asking for the healing of the daughter. You know, and Jesus said, is it right to take, you know, the bread from, you know, the children and cast it to the dogs? She was a Gentile being called a dog. And so here you get a picture of the Gentiles being the unclean animals. Not only that, remember when Peter was on the roof of Simon the Tanner and a sheet was let down from heaven and it was all different unclean animals on the sheet. Three times this happened and God told Peter, kill and eat. And he said, no, Lord, nothing unclean has ever touched these lips. And God said, don't call unclean what I've called clean. And then a knock at the door. And God sent Peter to the house of Cornelius. Amen. And Cornelius was a Gentile. So God showed Peter a sheet with unclean animals. And then Peter goes to the house of Cornelius, which is a Gentile. So unclean animals and Gentiles, you get the picture that we know that, you know, with Noah's Ark, there was seven of every clean that came into the boat and two of every unclean. Amen. So coming in through the door, there was only one way in. And Jesus said in John 10, 9, I am the door. So the only way to come into the Father is through the Son. He's the door. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three levels in the, in the boat, one ark, the Godhead, the Trinity, that's uh, just like the ark right here, there was the, the golden pot that had manna, Aaron dried that budded, and the Ten Commandments inside of that ark, that earthen vessel. It shows the Godhead, the three in one. So, um, you know, uh, also the Bible says that Noah pitched the ark. When he sealed it, you watch the movie Noah, that word pitch in the Hebrew is the word kafar. It means to atone or smear with blood. So a symbology 
of Jesus Christ to come. He is the ark that we must enter into. He's the door. He is, was a representation of the Godhead. He possessed the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And when we come into Jesus Christ, we find our rest. Noah's name means rest. We find our salvation in Jesus Christ. Um, the Bible says that in... Uh, in Genesis chapter 7, it says that the ark went upon the waters. That word went is uh, the Hebrew word halak, H-A-L-A-K. It's Strong's number uh, 1986 uh, or 56. And it means the ark, it literally means walked on the water. Literally. That's what the word, when it says the ark went upon the waters. And that's why our ark, Jesus Christ, came walking on the waters. And uh, Jesus said, I only do what I see my father do. And in Job 9, chapter 9, verse 8, it says that God walketh upon the seas. So Jesus, what he does, he comes walking on the Sea of Galilee. So just proving this, you know, this big deal. Um, we see the picture of this ark. Jesus said, you search the scriptures and then you think you have life, but they all speak of me. So the whole Old Covenant speaks of Jesus Christ. So we see Jesus in the ark. Y'all with me? Yes. Okay. Why does Noah matter? Um, also we see with Noah, um, we see the ten generations from Adam to Noah. I told you guys what it meant. It was Adam, Seth, Enosh, Kenan, Mahahil, Jared, Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, Noah. Ten generations and then God destroyed the earth, right? And then I gave you the actual meaning of each name. Adam, Adam, Jesus was the last Adam. Seth was next. Seth means appointed. When you take their names and break it down, it just simply means the second man, Adam, Jesus, was to be set in a position to be subject unto death. It was prepared beforehand. He would be a praiser of God that would come down and we would be translated. He would be our king and rule with a rod of iron. Satan would be loose for a short time and the end would come, final rest, Noah's name. So each of their names has a meaning and when you go to the Webster's Dictionary, you break it down, you see the God gospel written in Genesis chapter 5, way before, you know, Jesus even came, 4,000 years before he even shows up, if you be correct, about 3,500 years. Why does Noah matter? Let me show you something that um, the Lord spoke to me. Um, and this is not, this is not even a message. Um, first thing he spoke to me, what really caught my attention, um, uh, John started dealing with, before I get into that right there, John started uh, talking about something with all the things that are going on today. We have, you know, the possibility of a race war, which the government is pushing really hard. Oh, yeah. You know, they want, they want to cause, you know, civil, you know, uh, distress. And, and just like they do in the other countries and then come in and take over. I'll tell you another thing, the deal with Jade Helm that's out there, July 15th, the kickoff of Jade Helm. Um, they know what's going on, meaning that they know it's causing so much civil unrest right now. If this was just, listen to me, if this was just a training exercise, they would have backed off a long time ago. Now we have, um, we've just had Texas just asked for their gold back out of the Federal Reserve, yeah. right? They want their gold. They just asked peaceably, very nicely, they want to pull out the union. Texas wants to pull out the union. Well, let me tell you something. They're not going to be allowed to pull out the union. It's going to cause a war. We are on the verge of a war. If you guys remember, I told you that the blood moons back in 2007 when I got started, Mark Biltz had, you know, uh, brought it to my attention in 2007. Really started looking at them. A lunar eclipse just means war. That's what it means. Blood. Uh, a black sun means that, uh, which is a, a, a solar eclipse, which is a black sun, means war is coming to the Gentiles. A lunar eclipse means that war is coming to Israel. And so what we have is we have four blood moons consecutively, 2014, 2015. We're about to see a full solar eclipse and with a blood moon. So what's happening? We're going to see war again. World War III. I said this in 2007 that World War III was going to break out in 2015. 
I said it in 2007. There's people that are sitting in this congregation that heard me say it back then, okay? Um, which is, you know, I didn't find it. It's, it's all the Lord's doing. So we are on the president of some dire times or ahead of us. But we know, according to the word, no weapon formed against us shall prosper. What does that mean? Does it mean that you won't die? No, it doesn't mean. We might have to suffer. Amen. Those who are in Christ, you know, will suffer persecution. Um, so there are some things that is happening right now. They just passed the, the TPP, or the, yeah, the TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which just now have, has given Obama the rights as a dictator. You just If you don't know it anymore, you don't have a constitution. Your constitution was ripped out from on you uh, the day before yesterday, or yesterday when uh, Obama signed it. Now the United States is not like you know it, the United States of America, it's, you know, America, it's a corporation. It's not we the people, it's now, it's run, the president is not the president of the United States, he is the president of a corporation. That's what this place is now, it's a corporation. If you understand that, okay? Um, there's a lot of things that are going on, there's a lot of things that have happened that are moving quick. As the days of Noah were, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Amen. Why is Noah important? Why is Noah important? Well, Noah is important because Jesus said in Luke and in Matthew that as the days of Noah were, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Why is Noah important? Also, we just found out that they passed the, the gay legislation, the, the rights now that homosexual uh, people can get married now in all 50 states. Yeah. They didn't, they did not include, they included Texas in this deal. You understand? You know what that means now. Let me just kind of give you a heads up. That means now, if you are a 501c3, if you are a 501c3, any gay person that walks through that door, I don't care what your rights are, or what your, uh, your, um, what's that? Your beliefs are. What your bylaws are written in, it doesn't matter if you got written in your bylaws that you can't marry a man and a man or a woman and a woman, it doesn't matter. If you are a 501c3, they come to your door and ask you to marry them, you, you have either you're going to either accept and do it or you can say no I'm not going to marry you and next you'll be put in prison for a hate uh, a hate crime it'll be forced upon you and you'll go to prison listen I'm telling you what's coming down the pipe this is not the end of it this is the beginning this is the beginning of what's about to happen and I'm going to tell you something, you're going to watch churches all over America begin to marry. Why? Because they're going to strip away, if they don't, they're going to strip away their 501c3. And they're going to have to pay taxes to the government. You better believe it. This is the beginning of the patriotism, the, the government going after the patriots and going after the Christians. The gay rights movement is actually now going to begin. We want to get married. We want to get married at First Baptist Church of Poplarville. They're going to walk up over there, they're going to demand that they marry them, and when they, they say, no, we're not going to do it, then there's going to be, all hell is going to break loose. That's what we're on the verge of right now. Now it begins. You understand? Let me tell you another thing. Yes. Can I say something? I didn't get to tell you last night when that passed. Um, last night, the White House... Um, put uh, lights yeah, up yeah. at night and the entire White House was covered in rainbow colors. Oh Very good. This is listen now watch this. I did not know this. Watch. What's that? Now let me tell you let me tell you how important this is for you and me. I wrote down the other day why the Lord gave me the message. He said, um, why does Noah matter? Why does Noah matter? Oh, wow. Why does Noah matter? Because the covenant that God had given Noah right. was the rainbow, that he wouldn't flood the earth again. But as the days of Noah were, 
so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Amen. As the days of Noah were, homosexuality was rampant. And the homosexuals, homosexuality has taken upon their sign the rainbow. The rainbow that was on the, the White House last night was a sign to you and me that now is the days of Noah. Amen. Why does Noah matter? Because as the days of Noah were, they were going after strange flesh. And in First Peter, remember? Here, let's go to the uh, let's go to the scripture. As the days of Noah were, go to um, go to Peter. Open your Bibles up to Peter. Peter, it's Second uh, Peter chapter two. I'm gonna start reading. Verse 4, it says, For if God spared not the angels that sinned, what angels sinned? As the days of Noah, the sons of God came down to the earth. The sons of God came down to the earth and took the daughters of men and began to multiply. Right? The Bible says, As the days of Noah were, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. It says in Luke, As the days of Lot was, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. What was going on in the days of Lot? Sodomy. Sodom and Gomorrah. Homosexuality. What did the men? The men wanted to sleep with the angels. As the days of Noah were, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. As the days of Lot were, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Homosexuality has taken upon that themselves the covenant of God. You know what the covenant of God is? It's the rainbow around the throne. Amen. That's what that is right there. The rainbow actually goes around the throne of God in heaven. It's actually, it's in, you could see it in Revelations. They've taken upon that. It, it, it is a sign for you and me today. Amen. They hang it from their little visor, the rainbow. It was a covenant that God had destroyed all flesh because they went after strange flesh. They corrupted themselves. That covenant now has now been posted on our White House. It's been posted, it's, you know, it's on flags and murals and homosexuality. That's a sign to you and me that judgment is coming. You understand? That's what that means. That's what you need to recognize that as. As the days of... You think it's by coincidence that they've taken upon themselves the rainbow? They're throwing it back at God as a mockery. You destroyed us back then with the flood, but we're going to use your sign against you. Little do they know, it's only a sign back to them that God is going to destroy them by fire this time. Amen. This is what it says in 2 Peter. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them unto chains of darkness, to be reserved unto judgment, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. Listen, this is our life right now today. We're living in the days of Noah. Amen. We have entered into the ark. Our ark is Jesus Christ. That means that right now today, we need to stand up for righteousness. Amen. No matter what the government says, no matter what they do, no matter if they come in and say, I'm taking you to jail because this message that I'm ministering to you is going on YouTube. It's wrong. It is wrong. It is sin. And it's going to be judged. Hallelujah. Amen. Go ahead. You understand? Yes. And I'm not going to fall back. I will not marry homosexuals in the body of Christ. Amen. You can take that to the bank. Amen. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Amen. Don't fear what man can do to you, but fear with God who can destroy the body and the spirit. But listen to me. Jesus loves you. He hates the sin. He loves the person. I'm not against homosexuals. 
It's the sin of homosexuality. The sin of homosexuality brings death. You can't take two men and bring forth life. You can't take two women and bring forth life. You can only do it with a male and a female. That's it. You take two men and put them on an island, guess what? They'll die and they'll be gone. No habitation. No procreation. They can't do anything. Why does Noah matter? It matters. Because we are living in those days. We're living in the days when the sons of God came down and took the daughters of men. That word took means take, take, taken, raped, ravished. Against their own will. They were marrying and given in marriage. You know what the marrying part is there? It's not man and woman. They were marrying man and man, woman and woman, and given in marriage. What does given in marriage mean? It means that men were making deals with the offspring of the fallen angels. If you will give me this and give me that, I'll give you my daughter. What did Lot do? Don't take this man, these angels, but take my virgin daughters. He knew the importance of a covering. Lot brought them under his house. They were covered by Lot. He wouldn't give that covering up. You cannot give up your covering, which is Jesus Christ for nothing. It's fixing to get bad. It's fixing to get bad. Now it begins. <coughs> Everything I've been ministering on for three and a half years being here. God telling me what to say, what to do, what to say. Now is the time. Now you're going to see it. Now you're going to see it. It's going to begin to unfold. That's why this TPP, the Trans-Pacific Partnership, now allowing the trade that's going on. Canada now has to open up and do some things. They are signing things in secret that our Congress can't even look at. Congress, come in. Don't take a pen. Don't take a camera. You got a half an hour to look at 2,000 pages. We're making this in secret. It's called Fast Track. Why are they calling it Fast Track? Because, brother, it's coming down the pipe now. They know they have but a short time. The enemy knows he has but a short time. The enemy knows the end is drawing near. What are you also, how are we supposed to be right now? In all righteousness and godly living. Condemning the world by showing them that, listen, it's not right to do what you're doing. We can't be lying, stealing, drunkenness, fornication, adultery, deceiving your own self. If you're not under a pastor that's teaching you truth, get out! Because they're going to lead their sheep straight to the slaughter. They're going to say, it's okay. Listen, it's okay. Yeah, we're not in agreement with it, but you know, the government says we have to marry them. We know it's against us, but we need to love them. Man, watch what you're fixing to see. Noah, why does it matter? Jesus said, as the days of Noah, so shall it be when the, the, when the Son of Man comes. In Luke chapter 17, verse 26. Noah's life is prophetic. Noah's life is prophetic. It's a prophetic sign to you and me right now. And Noah's life, what was going on in his day... He saw it all, and he began to build. He moved with fear, and he began to prepare himself an ark. Listen to me. That word fear that he moved in is not the fear that you and I, you know, are thinking of, meaning he moved because God had spoke something to him. It says he believed God, and he moved. He moved. So if you really, truly believe the words that I'm telling you, Man, you're going to begin to prepare. Because I'm telling you, there's a storm coming. Amen. There's a storm coming. 
They didn't realize it, but for the first time in their life, you know, uh, it, it, from Adam to Noah was 1,656 years. And then for the first time, boom, a drop of rain fell. They never saw rain before. Noah's telling them, listen, God's going to flood the earth. They all knew it. Enoch prophesied it. Enoch prophesied it. They knew it. In fact, you know, um, it says that when, uh, when Methuselah was born, one of the translations of, of Methuselah's name means when he dies, it comes. So Enoch, Methuselah, Enoch bore Methuselah. Enoch knew it was coming. Enoch bore Methuselah, and Enoch said, when he dies, named him Methuselah, when he dies, it comes. What comes? The flood. They all knew it was coming. That's right. That's the truth. They all knew. Noah was a sign. Another sign that we had were in the end times. The movie Noah in 2014. The movie Noah itself was a sign that you, to you and me. That we're in the end. The world knows it's over. They're making the signs. They're telling us through the movies what's coming. That movie was a sign to you and me. Yeah, it was way off. But do you know who made it? A Jewish atheist. Oh, wow. Come on. Yes. He was the producer of the film, a Jewish, Jewish atheist. Don't be surprised that the Jews are intermingled, that they're the richest people in the world and they're intermingled with, you know, with the elite. They're all part of it. It's, you know, 95% of the Jews right now are all atheists. Did you know that? 95%. You know, it says, um, the movie Noah in 2014, uh, it was a Jewish, Jewish atheist that actually made the movie. When the door of the ark is closed by God, this is a prophetic picture of the age of grace is then completed. There's coming a time, and it's not too far ahead of us, that the door of grace is going to close. And it's going to be over with. We see that in the parable of the ten virgins. Five were ready, five were foolish, but they were all virgins. And let me tell you another thing about that. You know, you can be, you know, uh, engaged, betrothed. That doesn't make you a, that doesn't make you a wife. Understand? He that endures to the end. They were all virgins, meaning these virgins, they had all accepted, they had all become brand new again through Christ. Five were wise and store up and put oil away. And five were foolish. So when the bridegroom came, time for the marriage, there was only five that went in to get married, but they were all virgins. Many people today profess Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Many people today have walked the aisle and give themselves to, to the Lord. But there is a walk that you still have to walk out. You have to believe. It's by faith. He that endures to the end. So yeah, we carry the name of Jesus Christ right now. We're Christians. We're betrothed. We're engaged to Him, longing for His return to come and get us. And guess what? The Bible says in Revelations that when the Lord returns, He gives you a new name yeah. written in a stone. You see, we have a promise of a new name, but we haven't yet received it. We don't receive it till we get to heaven. Yeah. And we get our, you know, our white robe, our robe of righteousness. Um, I want to, uh, something interesting. And I told you guys about this, about the 6,000 years. Six days of creation. You know, uh, the, the, I'm just telling you the world's not millions of years old. I don't believe it. I can't find it in the scriptures. Six days of creation in the beginning. I know there's a gap theory people preach between Genesis 1 and 2. I, I don't know. I don't think. I can't find the gap anywhere. Um, but that's neither here nor there. What's important is Jesus Christ. Um, but I believe it's 6,000 years old, and I'll tell you why. The Bible says that man was created uh, on the sixth day. God rested on the seventh, right? Man was created on the sixth day. Um, there were six days in creation. He rested on the seventh. It's pretty funny that Genesis chapter 6, when he destroys the earth, it's in Genesis chapter 6, right? 
6,000 years. God destroys the earth, right? And then you find out that it was in the 600th year of Noah's life that it flooded. He was 600 years old, exactly, when God flooded the earth. That is that it's not by coincidence. A servant serves six years, he's released on the seventh. A man works six days, he takes, you know, on the seventh. God rested on the seventh day, six days of creation. Man created on the sixth day. It doesn't stop, it just keeps going on and on and on. Um, Noah gathered into the ark for six days. He gathered into the ark for six days and God closed the door on the seventh. And it started to rain. That's something. Um, I wanted to, this is really getting into, uh, did you know that, um, that Adam lived to see nine generations? Think about that. There was ten generations from Adam to Noah. Adam, Seth, Enosh, Kenan, and Mahal, Jared, Enoch, Methuselah, Lamech, Noah. 1,656 years. Now you think about, you know, okay, Adam lived and, and, you know, then we see Adam and Seth. Adam bore Cain and Abel first. Cain killed Abel. And then they had another son because Eve said, for God has appointed me another one after the one that Cain slew. And she named him Seth because Seth means appointed. So the generations of Adam, it starts Adam, Seth. Remember, Cain had to go. So it's Adam. He bore a son after his own image and after his likeness. He bore Seth. He was 130 years old when he bore Seth. 130 years after the fall, being put out of the garden, he bore Seth. He bore, he bore a, a man after his own image and after his likeness. Wow, that's in a fallen state. You thought about that? But if you look at the ten generations, so Adam was 130 years old when he bore Seth. Now Seth had a son. Watch this. So if you think about, okay, Adam, Seth, Enosh. Kenan, Mahahil. Say we get down to like four generations over here. You know, you're thinking, okay, Adam been gone. No, watch this. So Adam has got to see everything that's going on, all of what happened back then. Understand what I'm talking about? Meaning that he saw, for the first time, he saw the death, you know, of what he had done. I'm gonna, I'll read that to you, but listen to this right here. It says, uh, when Adam was 130 years old, he gave birth to Seth. When Seth gave birth to Enosh, his son, Adam was 235 years old. And when Enosh gave birth to Canaan, Adam was 325 years old. And when Canaan gave birth to Mahahil, Adam was 395 years old. And when Mahahil gave birth to Jared, Adam was 460 years old. So can you imagine all these generations? Hey, Papa, what was it like in the garden? What was it like when you walk with God? I mean, can you imagine really just like to be able to, you know, grant, we see our, our, our great, great grandson. That's all. We don't see no more than that. But can you imagine your great, 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 and all these grandsons? And what was it like? What did God look like in the garden, Papa? Man, Papa, why did you ever eat from that tree? Papa, look at all the killing that's going on. Because you ate because of what you did. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine ba bearing that burden? Can you imagine carrying that load? Adam, the burden bearer. And it says, and when uh, Mahahil gave birth to Jared, Adam was 460 years old. And when Jared, Jared gave birth to Enoch, Adam was 622 years old. And when Enoch gave birth to Methuselah, Adam was 687 years old. And when Methuselah gave birth to Lamech, Adam is now 874 years old. And Lamech gave birth to Noah. But he didn't get to see Noah. Adam died at 930 years old. Wow, before the flood. So he saw nine generations. That means everything that happened from the time of the fall. Here, let me just, let me just read this to you real quick. It says, uh, It is taught by Hebrew scholars, the first man uh, that was born, uh, Adam, he was born on Rosh Hashanah. We know all the story of Adam and his fall. 
But I want to take you on a little journey and show you some things that Adam saw in his lifetime. Let us begin a journey. In the month of September in our Western calendar is the first month that begins the Jewish New Year. During the time that Adam was created, everything was lush and green and pure and beautiful. Adam saw flowers such as vivid colors and beauty that we cannot even begin to understand. The amazement of it all. He actually walked with God himself. The rivers he saw was pure waters that were crystal clear as glass. The best way to try to comprehend the majesty of it all would be to compare it to the description and the word of God pertaining to the new holy city Jerusalem in Revelations 21. Everything that the Lord had created was intense in beauty. Adam's bride Eve was created beautiful, beautifully. The garden was eastward in Eden, and this is where the Lord had placed Adam. Adam walked in the midst of this pure beauty, and his eyes never fell upon anything that was not beautiful. He knew nothing else but what God had created. When Adam made the choice to disobey God, all of that changed. Adam no longer walked in pure beauty of the garden, nor did he eat freely from the land. Now Adam had to till the ground in order to produce food. That word till right there means to force or harass the ground to make it produce. That's why it's not right to force the tithe on someone. When you have to force or harass somebody to give money, that's robbery. You might as well just put a gun to them. What's the difference if I use a gun or I say, if you're not giving God his tithe, you, you a thief, and you're going to die in hell. I think I'd rather have a gun pointed to me. You're a thief and a robber. You're not giving God his money, you're a thief and a robber. You're going to burn in hell. Oh my God, burn in hell? That's worse than a gun. You know what that means? You're made, Charlene taught on ground, right? You were created from the dust of the ground, right? Right? If you're created from the dust of the ground, dust you and dust you shall return. Well, if I got to make you or force you or harass you, harass the ground, Cain had to harass the ground to make it produce fruit. God cursed the ground and said, no longer is it going to produce for you. Why? Because he, number one, killed his brother, but now he's forcing and harassing the ground. That's what you got to do. You got to till the soil up to plant to make it give to you. Right? You got to force it or harass it. That isn't the way the Word of God works. That's why in the New Covenant it's a free will offering. That's why Paul said, if you give, don't give out of necessity. Don't give angrily or grudgingly. But give, you know, as God's blessed you and you want as a cheerful giver. Pretty amazing stuff, huh? But the churches are everywhere all around. It's built that big monumental cathedrals everywhere out of forcing and harassing the sheep. That's what they do. And they missed it. See, God's not in building buildings. He's in building people. He's in building people. And God don't live in buildings. He lives in people. And don't you know that you're the temple of the Holy Ghost? And that's why Jesus said that you see that temple right there? You see that one? Uh, when he was talking to the 12 disciples? That one right there is going to be destroyed. Are you kidding me? Huh, the Jews don't pay tithes. Where they give it to? There ain't no temple. What you talking about? Why are you? Jesus said, you see that system right there? I'm going to do away with it. It's going to be gone. But you know what happened over here? We built new temples so that we can bring the money into the temple. And Jesus said it's going to be, it's going to be destroyed totally. You're the priest in the temple now. And when you see a need, meet a need. That's why God said today that take some food and go bless somebody. Why? Because you're the house of God. He's dwelling inside of you. You're the priest of God. The priest take care of the temple. And the priest fed the poor out of the temple. Pretty easy. To whom does the king require a tithe? And Luke, of his own children or others? Well, the king definitely doesn't require a tithe out of his own children. Peter said, others, Lord. Jesus said, therefore, the children are exempt. What did you say? I don't, I don't hear him preaching that scripture. Did you hear what I just said? Did you hear what I just said? Jesus said, the children are exempt. What does that mean? Can anybody in here raise a hand? Do you make your children pay you a tithe to live in your house? Would anybody raise their hand, please? Huh? Can you please raise your hand? Do you think God will? 
but man will. I'm not talking when you get up there that eight. Well, yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about though, right? Your family feeds the children. And you're going to give me 10% of that, which you made when you cut the grass. No. No. Don't get me started, son. <laughs> Fleece in the sheep. That's what it talks about in Peter. False prophets. And in Timothy. Gainsayers. They, they want to make merchandise of you. That's right. Jesus don't want your money. He wants you. I mean, he walks on streets of gold. If he's got you, he's got everything. Amen. You think giving 10% is going to get you in the gate? Pfft. Oh my God, you're following the law. Oh, what are you talking about? The law ain't going to get you in, Bubba. Love is going to get you in. And love surpasses the law. Amen. And I, there's people in here. There's people in here that has showed that, has done that. I know I'm supposed to give this, but look, I want to give you this. That's where it's about here. It says, when Adam made a choice to disobey God, all that changed. Adam no longer walked in the pure beauty, nor did he eat freely from the land. Now Adam had to till the ground in order to produce food. He had to feel the heartbreak and face he had to feel the heartbreak and face the horrible ordeal of one son killing another. He had to watch his wife suffer now in pain from childbirth. Because of his choice to disobey God, why am I saying his choice? Because. The Bible says that sin entered in through Adam. Not Eve. Amen. <laughs> He could have kicked old Satan out the garden. Through one man sent into the world, through another was taken, taken out through Christ. Adam saw the slaughter of the innocent animal and the shedding of blood for the first time in his life. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine being in, in colors that is absolutely nothing what we see today? Even in pastels and, and then all of a sudden... You know, God comes in there and says, because of this, animals that he loved and took care of, God tears the hide off of that thing. Can you imagine the, the look of horror that was in his face? Can you imagine that? It's no big deal to you and me because we see blood every day. He's carrying that now. He's the burden bearer. Amen. It says, Adam saw the slaughter of the innocent animal in the shedding of its blood so that he and his wife could be clothed with it. Can you imagine, for the first time in your life, God tearing the skin off of an animal and taking that and wrapping it around you? Oh my God. You got to wear that. You're clothed in sin. Think about it. Think of how rough it was for Adam and Eve. They went from a life of innocence and pure beauty to a life of experience, the experiencing the effects of sin. And it was just the beginning. A little bit more and I'm done. The Bible tells us in Genesis 5 that Adam saw nine generations of his sons. From Seth all the way to Lamech. A lot happened through the lifetime of nine generations. Adam saw the lawlessness of man. He saw the whole earth filled with violence. He saw the sons of God taken and raping the daughters of men. And can you imagine the people pointing and say, Hey, Adam, you see what just happened down the street? It's your fault. It's your fault. He's carrying a burden. He's a picture of Christ. Wow. I don't know how Adam, Adam ever managed to deal with what he had saw every day. Think about it. People today still blame Adam and Eve for the, same, for the sin that we face. People today still do it. That's right. Can you imagine the people in Adam's time, how they treated him? I believe that for every act of violence, death, abuse, 
Satan was right there rubbing it in Adam's face, reminding him that all this was happening because of what he had done. He had to deal with this for 930 years, the span of his lifetime. Even if all the people of his time were gone, the earth itself tells the story that Adam saw every year. Can you imagine? Not only the people showed it, but for the first time when he took a bite of that fruit, the trees died. So, are they ever going to come back again? So every year he's got to watch and see the trees die to remind him of sin. Anyway, this is a picture of Jesus Christ. Just as Adam bore all of that, you know, Jesus came to take all of that even off of him. He became the burden bearer. He bore all of those sins, every single one of them, for you and me. We're living in the days of Noah. And the only way that you can enter into the, to the ark is through Jesus Christ. It's through, it's through Him that we get to enter in. He's the bread that came down from heaven. He's the blood of the new covenant. He's the door. And if you don't enter into it, guess what? You're not protected. You're not protected. So, Father, let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, Lord. Your Word is so good. Your Word gives us foresight to know what's coming. Not only does it give us foresight, it tells us how we're to prepare. We need to prepare our hearts. We need to prepare, you know, have our mind fixed on the Word of God that we know, Father, that no weapon formed against us shall prosper. We know that Jesus Christ is the ark of our salvation. And if you haven't received Jesus, today you need to receive Him so that you can enter into that door. So, Father, today we, um, Lord, we just come to you, Father. And, Lord, we know the enemy has got plans. We know that, uh, that they're going to try to do all kind of crazy things that are out there, but they forgot your plans, Father. They forgot one factor, you, the God factor. They didn't factor you into all of this, Father. We're your children. So, Father, I pray, Lord, for boldness in the end times. No matter what happens, Father, I pray for direction and guidance and instruction from your word to tell us what it is that we need to do as a body, as, as your bride, as your believers, Lord. Especially, we see the times that we're in. Father, they're flashing it, you know, on the, the so-called White House. That house ain't white, Lord. It's a whitewashed sepulcher full of dead man's bones. That's what that place is, Lord. And we know we're living in the end times. But Father, I pray that you give us boldness to, to walk as Enoch and, and Moses and all of the prophets before us and as Jesus Christ to speak your word with boldness, Father. To be a witness, to be a testimony unto them. That, Lord, we know that we're going to be able to shine brighter. The darker it gets, the brighter we're going to shine, Father. So if you guys, if you, if you want to accept Jesus and you haven't, man, the Bible says if you confess Him before men, He'll confess you before the Father. You don't have to stand up. You don't have to walk down the aisle. Ain't that something? Wow. <laughs> Check that one out. You don't have to stand up. You don't have to walk down the aisle. So everybody's looking at you. Because it ain't got, it don't have nothing to do with nobody. It has something to do with you and Jesus Christ. That's what it has something to do with. And you can accept Him in your heart. You can ask, you can confess your sins before the Father with you and Him. And say, Father, I'm a sinner and I need a Savior. And I need to get in the ark. You don't have to walk up the aisle. But I will encourage you to do this. If you do it, tell somebody. Because if you confess Him before people, He'll confess you before the Father. God's good, isn't He?